Welcome back, boys and girls. It's about that time of day again here, folks. 27th of February, 2014, almost to the end of the month. My name is Joseph James. Welcome back to your nightly newsletter. This evening, got a special newsletter for you this evening. Big winning trades, Janet Yellen, Mardi Gras, and the end of the month. What do these all have in common? Well, you'll have to stick around and listen in for tonight's newsletter. Tonight, we're going to talk about, first of all, two big winning trades that were called last night on the newsletter. Hope you guys are paying attention. We also will talk a little bit about what the markets did today. All eyes were on Janet Yellen, pretty much sideways ranges for the most part, with the exception of you-know-who. We'll talk about that in a moment. We'll take a look at some of the news today, kind of a sleepy news day, with the exception of our chair, uh, of our, uh, of our uh, chairperson Yellen, excuse me, and a little bit of this day in history, and then we're going to roll up our sleeves and get ready for tomorrow. Now, so far, the new format with our two-video, two-part series of our newsletter seems to be going very well. I want to thank you guys for your feedback. I want to thank you for your patience this week while we kind of navigate it through a little bit of a new format. If you have any feedback for me, though, please don't hold back. I would love to know your feedback. Do you want to see more? Do you want to see less? Do you want to see different? All right, let me know what you guys like and what you don't like. That way I can keep improving our newsletter. First of all, last night, rewind the tape. If not, click on that link below the video here to follow those trades. If you were here with me last night, I gave you three different opportunities to make some money today. If you followed them, gold, there was no trade. Gold went sideways. Crude, great sell there at 102.93. I mean, does it get, each, does it get any easier than that, guys? Last night, 24 hours ago, I told you be looking out for that 102.93 level on crude and to sell it. And right now we're holding that short down to 101.42. Same thing last night on the mini Russell. Gave you a buy at 1172.4. We're currently holding that long up to 1194.8. So two big winning trades. Both were called last night well before those trades set up. So no excuses there, kiddos. So follow those trades, and of course, we'll, we'll keep you guys up to date. And remember, stick around towards the end of this today on part number two of this newsletter. We're going to give you some more trades for tomorrow. So don't say I'm not warning you, right? Lots of winning opportunities here coming out in our newsletter part number two. So stick around. Markets today, for the most part, with the exception of the Russell, right? Surprise, surprise. For the most part, had a pretty, a pretty sideways day. We pegged crude being a moving market early, but it pretty much ended the day uh, flat, a little bit less than, a uh, little bit, a little bit more than negative uh, 0.50%. So a little bit less than uh, one half of one percent. 133 ticks on crude for the range wasn't a big day, but the key number here is the closing print today on crude at 102.09. Now on the second part of our newsletter, we're going to talk about the importance of being down around the 102 area. If you remember last night, we thought we were in store for some higher prices today, but that didn't happen. So 102.09, a very important closing print today on the black gold. Make sure you stick around for the second portion of the newsletter where I'll talk about what we're going to be using with that number for tomorrow. Gold, uh, again, very small ranges today, 124 ticks. This is a, a very small range for gold. And you can see gold finished the day today just down 0.13%. So 0.13% in the negative, pretty much a flat day on gold, and we still keep hovering around that 1331.5 area on gold. Mini Russell was, again, the big mover of the day today, and really today, not a very big move, but we still continue to find great trading opportunities on the Russell and the other E-minis. Russell moves 168 ticks today, closed just above one half of 1%, 0.58%, at 1187.7. Again, Russell's having no problems pushing those all time highs, but the S&P is having a little bit of trouble, right? S&P's still banging its head against the wall, uh, against that 1850 to 1852 range. It continues to be just a kind of a pain in the rear end uh, for all the S&P traders out there. Meanwhile, the Russell just keeps on chugging along. People always ask me why I trade the Russell instead of the S&P. And I always explain to them, I don't care where I make my money. I don't care what market I trade. I'm looking for a market that is a balance between volume and volatility. Because usually it's one without the other. Want a good example? Check out natural gas. 
silver. These are very low volume commodity markets and they are all over the place. Not enough volume, too much volatility. Then you go to a market like crude oil or Russell. Not too much volume, just enough volume to keep it volatile, but not all over the place volatile, right? So the lower volume markets, again, markets such as mini crude, mini gold, right? Those are really low volume markets. Um, when I think of low volume, I think of silver, I think of copper, I think of natural gas, right? I think of illiquid markets that are just excessively volatile, right? Wheat comes to mind. So with, without much volume, we get a lot of volatility. That's dangerous, okay? All the kids at home, just because you see the chart going like this doesn't mean you can trade it, okay? Be careful on those illiquid markets, all right? We'll talk more about that in training. So you've got some markets that are low volume, high volatility, and then you've got other markets on the opposite side of the spectrum, which are high volume and low volatility. Which would those be? Euro, bonds, uh, in, 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 uh, in Germany, the Euro stocks, right? Some of the high volume equity markets, um, the S&P. S&P would definitely be one of those high volume, it's the most traded market in the world, high volume, low volatility. So I want something in the middle. That's why I trade crude, gold, Russell. I do trade Euro, but it's the only currency I trade. It's the one that trades the most. So crude, gold, and Russell have that balance. Not too much volatility, not too much volume, just enough there to make the market move, but to make sure still there's liquidity, right? And liquidity is important because like a market like natural gas, if you're stuck in that trade short and it's going higher, you're not getting out of that trade right? You are done, right? Broke. You're going to go belly up and blow that account. So be careful with illiquid markets, but that's why I trade the Russell instead of the S&P. Again, I don't care about a trade. I just want the market to move. And I want it to move in a way that's still safe for me to trade. And most importantly, safe for you as one of my students to trade. So markets today, relatively sideways, relatively flat. I think they were saving their energy for, for Janet Yellen. Right. Pretty much we assume today, well, let, let's, let's back up. Yesterday, what happened? Russell, remember yesterday's Russell? Huge range. So today we're expecting a range bound morning on Russell and it started that way, but towards the end of the morning, it just jumped. So there were some situations that we were expecting. Gold was sideways this morning. Uh, crude opened up right in the middle. Uh, actually, crude opened up at the highs and tumbled in the middle. I'm going to go over all that in the charts though in part number two. Today's news. News was mixed today on the economic news front. We came in, we had durable goods orders, not as bad as they were expecting. Today was a good example on durable, go uh, durable goods, excuse me, luckily I'm not an English teacher, but durable goods orders, they were expecting negative 1.7%, they got negative 1%, right? So it was not as bad as they were expecting, right? Sometimes bad news can be seen as good news. And right now, all these manufacturing reports, if you remember, this bad weather has really put a, put a hamper on these manufacturing reports. So there is a glimmer, there is a glimmer of, of shining, <laughs> shining light here in the durable goods orders because the core components of the durable goods orders were growing. And that's what we needed to see. We needed to see that there was gonna be a light at the end of the tunnel here of all this bad weather and all these doomsday news reports. Jobless claims came out higher than expected. Very interesting as we go into next week's non-farm payroll report. Remember, jobless claims towards the end of the month are pretty interesting, pretty important. And we're going to be kind of hanging our hat on those for next week's for non-farm payrolls. So higher than expected. It was pretty much flat, pretty much within expectations. So a bullish durable goods orders. I think the durable goods orders really gave the, the, I don't know, all the speculators out there a little bit of a pat on the rear end saying, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this bad weather. And then we heard from Janet Yellen. And Janet Yellen was what we assume was most people were waiting for this morning. And I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I've, I haven't been around on this planet very long. I'm only 32 years old. Um, so I came in, you know, when I graduated high school, we were still dealing with, with Greenspan, right? That crazy, you know what? Uh, then, of course, we had Ben Bernanke, right? He, had, of course, had two terms. And then now we have Janet Yellen. So out of all the Fed chair people, I got to say, Janet Yellen, I kind of like her. I kind of like her. I don't know. I don't really know that much about her other than her policies and what she's voted on in the past. But watching the broadcast today while she was speaking, you know, I, 
I, I kind of like her, right? I don't know what I don't know what that means to you guys, but uh, she comes off as being a very, uh, very uh, approachable, very smart woman, and she clearly doesn't have an ego, which I thought was pretty, pretty relatable. You know, nobody wants to see a politician with with, with a bunch of ego. And it was interesting to see today how the Senate Banking Committee, uh, they're a bunch of human beings just like us. It was kind of cool to see Janet Yellen sitting in front of the Senate Banking Committee. Remember, this Senate Banking Committee. These are the guys that grilled Geithner for six months. I mean, these guys are sharks. They, they're, they're paid. Their job is to tear Janet Yellen apart. And they were very nice and very kind. And it was a very interesting scenario. It was almost like for a moment there, I thought I was just watching normal people and not politicians with their masks and their egos and fill in the blank. But basically, Janet Yellen today, we were, we were honing in on her, on her testimony today. Not necessarily the testimony. But it was the live Q&A afterwards, right? You're not going to get anything out of the testimony. The testimony is printed out the night before. But the Q&A afterwards, this is, where, this is where anything can come out of her mouth. And so we heard her say basically everything we thought she was going to say today. Uh, first of all, blame it on the weather. So the first question was, are all these bad news reports, are these because of the weather? And so her, her reaction today was, absolutely, in the short term, this is definitely this is definitely weather right weather affected. But she did comment though to say that the weather hasn't been that bad the past few weeks. So the next few months, if those news reports don't rebound, then we're going to have some cause for concern. Right? Again, we pretty much assumed that's what she was going to say. But I was curious to see kind of the tone and what was between the words. Right? What she didn't say. What was also very very interesting that she said today was she pretty much blamed a lot of the problems on Congress. Now, how quickly if we forget, remember that little snafu before the debt ceiling thing where, right, where we actually shut down the government? Remember that? We sent out and put fences around all the national monuments and, right, really upset all the veterans. Remember that little deal, remember that little deal back then? Of course, how could you forget, right? We turned off the government in the United States. They're saying right now that cost us almost 2% of GDP, 2%. Right? That's a lot, a lot of money. So she said today that pretty much Congress and the political agendas and the saber rattling and the intimidation tactics and the jockeying back and forth, she didn't point a finger, but she came pretty close to making it very clear that she was not happy with the way that Congress had handled um, the, the bickering back and forth. And it pretty much cost us a lot of growth in the recovery. She also mentioned that we were still very data dependent. She used the exact word this morning. It was incredible. Right at 10 o'clock this morning, the, the exact word that came out of her mouth. What was it, guys? You were, you were there with me this morning listening to it. Accommodative monetary policy, right? Accommodative monetary policy. Basically, what that means is, is that the Fed is going to continue to make money cheap, they're going to continue to keep rates down. They're going to continue to do whatever it takes to make the recovery continue, right? So basically, that's what pushed crude up. That's what pushed Russell up. And literally, look at your charts. Look at your charts. It's 10 o'clock on the nose. There was no other news at that time. Everyone was reacting to Janet Yellen. And I thought this was also very funny. Towards the end of her testimony in the Q&A section, somebody asked about Bitcoin. And she she. It was, it was funny. I was laughing because I, you kind of see in her eyes, she wanted to say, why are you wasting my time with this Bitcoin, right? A Bitcoin? What the heck's a Bitcoin, <laughs> right? So, but she basically made it very clear that Bitcoin was not even close to being on the Fed's radar, that if they had to, they'd put together a regulatory body to oversee it, but that she was nowhere near even thinking about worrying about Bitcoin because it's not a banking institution, right? There's, there's no legal banking going on. So I thought that was kind of interesting to see Bitcoin slip in the back door and find a way into that testimony here. A little bit of pop culture there for you. So a pretty active day, relatively flat news, but it was nice to hear from Janet Yellen. If you didn't get a chance to see her testimony, uh, you can probably find it online. I would recommend you watch it. It was, it was pretty cool to see her for the first time um, in, in real living color because she's a pretty nice lady. She seems like a very respectable person and a good head to our Fed, whatever your political views are. This day in history, one of my favorite parts of our newsletter. Only got a couple of them today, but boy, are they important. February 27th. 1827, 1827, almost 100 years ago, costume students, after traveling abroad to France, they bring back 
costumes, masks, and they have the first, I would assume, intoxicated dance through the streets of New Orleans. That becomes the first Mardi Gras celebration. And of course, we all know, ever since that first February 27th, 1827, that has completely changed the definition of plastic bees, right? Now every adolescent teenage boy out there has a very different opinion on the value of those plastic beads. Who would have thought? I'll let you guys Wikipedia that one. But obviously, though, 1827, pretty cool, pretty fun. I've never been to Mardi Gras before. One of the things that I probably will never do. I'm uh, not a fan of heights, and I'm definitely not a fan of big sweaty crowds of people who <laughs> It just doesn't apply to me. If I go to Mardi Gras, it'll be in a private, it'll be in a private helicopter looking over the top, right? Saying, oh, look at that, looks fun. All right, let's go, let's go back to the Ritz Carlton. So, next thing here, February 27th, 1991. Now, this is pretty, this is pretty important. All right, I'll tell you right now, I have, I have so many amazing clients. I have so many amazing students around the world, but I have some very, very amazing people that I know in Kuwait. And if you didn't know this, right, if you were, if you were born less than 20 years ago, uh, you probably didn't know that at one time uh, the Iraqi military tried to occupy Kuwait. And, of course, the U.S. launched the Gulf War. Whether or not you were pro or against or whatever your political views are on that, it's a very interesting scenario to learn more about. February 27, 1991, our friends in Kuwait are liberated from Iraqi control via the Gulf War, right? Desert Storm, whatever we called it back then. I was a very young individual. I barely remember it. I remember it, but obviously being very young, it didn't have the impact. What's amazing though, what's really amazing when you learn more about the Gulf War and you learn about what the Kuwaiti people were going through at that time, the Iraqis came in and they just took everything. And that's why uh, this was, I believe, it was the, it was the largest coalition it was, uh, it was Saudi Arabia, it was Great Britain, it was the U.S. Who else was it? There was one other country out there that, again, everybody put their troops together. Saudi Arabia actually paid the whole bill, the whole bill for that war. It was a pretty amazing thing. And, of course, on the way out of town, the Iraqis, they set, uh, what was it, 350 oil wells on fire. And it polluted the air, uh, as you can imagine, for months. It was, a, it was a horrible disaster area there in Kuwait. But boy, I'll tell you, what an amazing story about, the, about freeing the, uh, uh, the country of Kuwait, right? Very interesting and amazing people out there. So to all my friends out in Kuwait, happy birthday to you today, right? 1991, boy, time flies. Now, before we finish up today, let's get ready for tomorrow. We have a very important scenario unraveling tomorrow. First of all, tomorrow's the end of the month. The end of the month, the end of the quarter, the end of the year, the end of the day, the end of the week. Tomorrow is the end of the week and the end of the month of February. That means what? Desperation trades. We're going to have all those traders that have to get things accomplished before the end of the month. And then guess what? Next week, we got the beginning of the month. Just the same thing. Lots of volatility, lots of volume entering and exiting the market. We definitely are excited for tomorrow, end of the month, end of the week. We also know tomorrow, starting this evening, in just a few hours, we have news coming out of, uh, out of Japan. We have a whole slew of economic news starting just before 7 p.m. Eastern time tonight. So if you thought you weren't going to get any trades overnight tonight, think again. We've got one of the world's largest economies out of Japan with lots of news coming out tonight. Then we roll over into Europe. We got the UK home prices at 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Now remember, earlier this week, we saw record-breaking home loan approvals from the United Kingdom. Tomorrow morning at 2 a.m., we're going to hear from the home prices. It'll be very interesting to see if those home prices are following the approvals for the mortgages. Then we move into Europe, 5 a.m., consumer prices in Europe. So we got news tomorrow at 2 a.m. in Europe, 5 a.m. in Europe. That's going to be great for you guys trading the London session tomorrow morning. And then, of course, we go into U.S. Tomorrow we get a bunch of news here in the U.S., but the headline number tomorrow is 8.30 a.m. GDP. It'll be very interesting to see what the gross domestic product looks like quarter to quarter tomorrow morning at 8.30. Then we've got uh, 10 o'clock consumer confidence. We've got a bunch of the little news events there. That'll be on the blog here for you this evening. So, as we talked about it, Heard from Janet Yellen today. 
Pretty much sideways ranges. Again, E-minis still nice and bullish out there right now, so make sure you buy those pullbacks. Very good day, though. We made a bunch of money in the trade room today. Literally, we made close to $1,000 today before 10 a.m. I mean, it was, it was easy money in the room this morning. Congratulations to the students out there that made money with us this morning. And if you didn't make any profit with us, if you missed the trade room today, what are you waiting for? Come out and see me tomorrow. 8 a.m. Eastern time, I open up the trade room. We do training every day at 11 o'clock, 11, 11.30. And tomorrow's a Friday, so we'll be finishing up a little bit early. Right? We'll take off a little bit early tomorrow on Friday. You guys have a great weekend. But we're not done yet, though. We're not done yet. Don't leave me now. If you want to make some money with me tomorrow, let's grab a look at some of these charts and let's see what levels we have to work with. I've already given you a total of five winning trades this week. This this week alone. Two last night, three the night before. All right? So don't go leaving me now. Stick around. Below this part number one video, scroll right on down. You'll see part number two. We'll roll those sleeves up, grab some charts, and get ready for the end of the month. I'm excited. I hope you are too. Hope you had a great week with us this week. Thanks for watching again. And don't forget, send me your feedback. I want to make sure we keep getting better every time we do the newsletter. Let's get started.